to introduce is a whole new way of viewing subjects and the effect of their positionality in a social structure, the term also shifts our frame of reference and outlook in a way that lends itself to reducing other impacts on our life world as a whole. And here are two examples of impacts. One thing, this structural analysis of vulnerability tends to be thoroughly immersed in reckoning and retribution and in protecting the victim to the extreme, that it often intervenes in the law's proper course and conventional judgment. A highly charged witch craze extends itself from the culprit to any judge that insists on sticking by the law and its processes, overlooking popular verdict demands that clearly defy common legal interests. With successive cases of grievance, the crowd's unresolved frustration and, and anxiety are compounded and continuously built toward uncontrollable explosions of righteous indignation. In this kind of energy buildup, preventive or proactive measures that aim to make up for vulnerability often run the risk of overextension or crass application in the hands of eager zealots. In recent years, these popular actions have grown strong and frequent. And the law is really being messed up. For well, another thing, vulnerability discourse can easily weaponize any various social differences as asserting, by asserting with moral outrage, the absolute undesirability and hence outright dismissal of all hierarchical structures as oppressive and victimizing, undemocratic and backward. In recent years, the workplace, the home, the campus, Three sites where hierarchical relationships are quite naturalized in their daily operations have witnessed a wave of admonishing directives that work to intimidate the bosses, the parents, and the teachers' authority and their demands for standards of performance. All disciplinary measures ranging from corporal punishment to verbal reproach are either nullified or challenged. A new flat world in social relations and performance evaluations is imagined to be regulated only by the rights discourse of higher individualization. I don't know if that has happened at Duke in Kuchan <laughs> yet or not. The teachers are finding it difficult to teach because your authority is eroding. Authority even in knowledge is eroding. I don't have time today to go into details about these developments and their consequences for social cohesion. But it's obvious that in our day and age of growing civility yet precarity, the idea of vulnerability in relation to gender sex triggers something in many, if not all of us, to the extent that many feel a much stronger sense of righteous indignation toward gender sex injustices than before. But why do these explosions of energy and emotion tend to concentrate on gender sexuality related cases and issues, while many other social injustices usually meet with cold indifference? My two cents worth of an answer is a gender sex reorientation or a gender sex turn has already taken place in social life, in legal domain, as well as in international politics, manifesting itself not only in the emergent structure of gender governance that I have just described, and not only in the global presence and strength of CEDAW and its demands, but also in the growing global currency, and just as often, tension, uh, surrounding a host of progressive values exemplified and promoted by the UN, as well as the so-called advanced countries. Such values include respect, equality, diversity, friendliness, and so forth. And they are said to concretely describe a world where formal gender equality is heralded as a must achieve goal for backward nations. Women and children are to be vigilantly guarded because they're weak and vulnerable. Coupled relationships must practice egalitarianism. And gay marriage right is a symbol of envied freedom and equality. 
While those who embrace such values celebrate this proud progressiveness, previously acquiescent conservative crowds are also becoming outspoken and militant in contending what is perceived as Western influence or worrisome individualistic tendencies. This deeply entrenched, this deeply entrenched and growing dividedness is already spreading in various societies and cultures. If this gender sex transformation has already produced a lot more than expected or desired, then how should we conceive of gender sex studies in our own Chinese knowledge production? If most gender sex related concepts and theories and theoretical systems that so many of us are drenched in, if, we, if they are already here, then how should we reconceive our mission to do research on gender sex issues with at least a post-colonial or decolonializing vision? I don't have ready answers for these important questions and reminders. After all, this is a project that would need the work of a few generations before real results will mature. But some of us have begun to reevaluate what had been left behind in our eager pursuit of modernity. Some have turned to our age-old traditional cultures to try to excavate intellectual resources that maybe for historical reasons could provide usable ideas outside the Western paradigms, but closer to the Chinese life world. If the advancement of Western modernity had made other cultural heritages unappetizing and Western values and practices enviable so far, the table is now turning as, for example, China and India, two of the oldest cultures, regain their power of influence and hence a sense of confidence through the new globalizing economy. Consequently, interest has again been ignited to study ancient long before Western modernity made its presence felt in the world, ancient cultures and knowledges that had held out a complex and diverse wealth of gender sexualities and other cultural possibilities. This time, not as underdeveloped, immature hopefuls that, ser that serve only to make Western achievements appear all the more desirable, but instead as self-sufficient cultures and subjects in their own rights and in all their brilliant exuberance. As ideas and traditions are being excavated from local cultures, there's also the necessary work of rethinking the universalizing gender sex discourses of Western civilized modernity in the context of a much larger framework of history, society, and culture. Instead of the usual, a historically conceived human rights claims phrased in individualistic terms, work needs to be done to examine the basic premises of politically correct ideas employed by gender sexuality politics and look into the historical social conditions that made them desirable and workable and universal in the first place. Attention should also be paid to what emerging conditions and situations are working to expose their limitations and consequences. The work of historicizing, contextualizing, and relativizing must pick up speed. In the meantime, a host of other cultures and societies are finally becoming accessible new sources of knowledge as global mappings are reconfigured today. For example, interest in the Islam world, Central Asia, the African continent, and their diverse cultures is growing and accumulating with encouragement of the Belt and Road Project. To continue to think that some cultures are, to quote someone bluntly, shitholes, their cultures as uncivilized, their people as unenlightened, and their society as backward, only manifests an unproductive and dangerous attitude. In this upcoming long process of learning about the human world in all its historical phases and social complexities, we can only be humble and take in as much knowledge and understanding as possible to avoid 
passing categorical critique or judgment on all cult cultural resources at hand, progressive or conservative, traditional or modern. It is time to cooperate and learn, not divide and judge. Thank you.